Uh, NASA has helped us in being able to, as I said, locate underwater river reservoirs. In fact, if you look at West Asia, almost all the vegetables and fruit from Asia actually comes from desert areas. But the reason that they can do this is because even the ancient cultures knew how to get the water out of the ground, water you don't even see. Because if it was on the surface of the desert area, it would have evaporated. But if it's underground, you can actually preserve water. So we're even looking at agricultural techniques, and we would hope that maybe some people could implement this, and that is instead of growing food outside in the desert where there's great water evaporation, to look at hydroponics, to go underneath the ground even in small caves and use the sun to bring in the light that's necessary, have minimal mineral resources, and then the water continues to recycle because there's very little evaporation. Indeed, we call this Project Oasis many years ago where we would have the opportunity of solar collectors above the ground pulse the information and energy beneath the ground where computerized systems would be able to process food in underground food factories. So we're looking at tremendous opportunities even through airborne devices that can collect the condensation, create the water streams, bring that back carefully to the planet, and we would have opportunities to recycle also the groundwater that's been polluted very, very effectively. So let's look at cost, because this is something that's realistic. The cost of one cubic meter of water that's easily accessible can be as little as 35 cents. The cost of one cubic meter of desalinated water can be $3.75, obviously a big steep climb. One of the other options, find new ways of desalinization. And some countries have been able to do that. In fact, they've used green energy, so to speak, or solar energy, and in some cases wind energy, depending on where the, uh, the desalinization plant is, to reduce the cost of that. So you can't look at water without looking at energy. You can't look at water without looking at climate change. So all these factors have to enter into a unified, holistic picture. Scientists have calculated the amount of water from the southern aquifers to be equivalent to the flow of 200 years of water in the Nile River area. And so Libya, with all of the fantastic opportunities it still has, has committed itself to a new process of a whole new area of water collection and water safety. Right, so water, what we're showing here in the graph is that water that's probably been collected on that part of the world for over a million years, or at least 10,000 years, could be used up with this advanced pipeline and uh, demand that's acquired right now in just 100 years. So all the aquifers could easily be gone. These are a lot of serious projects. We're talking about periods of some 40,000 years plus in terms of antiquity. But let's move on to other parts of Africa, and I think we have to be concerned about Africa because it's one of the places where there's less money and uh, probably not a lot of technology. This is why we're working in South Africa as well as in Lesotho, in neighboring countries to bring, as it were, a whole new educational effort to get people to realize that there is a vast reservoir of water under the Kalahari that could be tapped in South Africa. There are places strategically all throughout Africa that could be used if we have the means and the perceptual direction to see a larger roadmap of new water resources. And the sad thing is that water will probably become a major cause of war conflicts, especially in the East. Now, one of the situations is we've always looked at oil. We feel many people have uh, felt that the last so many uh, decades has oil has been the cause of war, but in the future decades, very commonly, it could be water as a source of war. For instance, Egypt has threatened war on any country that takes water from the Nile without its permission, and India has been arguing with Bangladesh over the Ganges, and Pakistan over the Indus River. So there's many, many factors. Some of these things go back to treaties, even with the British, who allocated water in certain areas. It's hard to come together when your people are starving or need water. And this is why we're having the celebration of the H2O, because we recognize that we all share, really, the water of life. We are all custodians and water keepers, particularly the women throughout the world who have received the great compassion and the great connection with Mother Earth. And so it's the cry of Mother Earth. It is the 
veins of Mother Earth that we are opening now with the new processes of locating water resources, but also the harmonics, the music and psychology that goes with this, that gives us, as it were, a mental preparation for the new, shall we say, era of the water covenant. Right, and so none of these things have to take place. We don't need to be in water stress or even water scarcity anywhere in the world if we would use our new technology and use our hearts in making changes on the planet. And this includes even the United States. There's parts uh, of the West that have been all completely linked up with Colorado, with Oregon, with California, with Nevada, with Arizona. This was a tremendous project to really help people throughout the West. Why can't we do that in the Midwest and the East? I believe that the government of the United States should not rely any longer on rainfall, but if we hooked up the entire Eastern coast and Midwest, we could establish not only a way of preventing floods, but also a way of allowing water to flow in areas where maybe like Atlanta had been experienced, a severe drought. Why can't Atlanta get water from the Midwest? It certainly can. It just takes a significant project like that, which was already done in the western part of the United States, to be done in other parts of the United States as well. And this goes on for all over the world. In fact, we need to establish a way to conserve and also recycle all water resources. This has been demonstrated in Washington and other parts of the American Midwest of the ability to harness, as it were, a whole new tubular system to protect the water, as well as to use a type of fiber optic system to remove the pollutants. Also, oftentimes the water that runs, uh, the falls, we'll say, in during rainstorms is just lost, especially in places like California. It actually just goes right out into the ocean and becomes salt water. So one of the options, which has been done, especially in Europe, is to collect the rainwater and use that for watering the garden, using it for the toilet water, using it for the washing of the clothes, and using it for swimming pools, because it can also be filtered if you have any so problems. So approximately 50 to 65 percent of the water that's normally lost can be recycled and used, as Swiss engineers have shown in their building plan. Right, and there's plenty of ways of developing new techniques of water purification. This is being done in Southern California, and I have to give credit to some of the communities there that have taken this very, very seriously. One of the other additions is the toilet itself is one of the largest consumers of water in rural uh, urban communities. And the new toilets that are being uh, developed take uh, mostly air and a little water to flush. So by flushing it yourself with the handle, you're creating the air pump. So there's no electricity and nothing, but it works really efficiently and really, really well. So this is something we highly recommend. Also, Norwegian and Swedish engineers have developed what is known as the dry toilet, the separation of the urine from the human waste. And this has been implemented throughout South Africa and other regions of the developing world very effectively. Now, one way also to control water flow uh, especially rain, we've noticed, and scientists have come to the conclusion, especially from research in the Amazon, is to plant trees. If you have a lot of trees in the area, you will get an increase of rainfall in that area. If you cut the trees, you get a decrease. So you could actually almost manipulate how much rain is needed in areas by the amount of trees planted. And of course, we have to uh, credit um, people in Kenya, and who won the uh, Nobel Award for planting trees throughout the area and increasing the amount of water given to the people. And so let's take a closer look at other ways. Monitoring pollutants in the agriculture industry and household products requires, as it were, an understanding of the effectiveness of our filters, of pointing out the relationship between the clean water table and that which is the rockish water and the water of heavy pollution. But regardless of what you do around your house with uh, collecting rain bales of water or anything, you find that throughout the world, 70% of the water used worldwide is used in agriculture. So that means that's one of the key places that we really have to make a difference in the way we use water to grow plants.